SpaceX's latest Starship vehicle, which has often been referred to as Starship V2, is a massive upgrade over what has flown to date. In fact, it has way more new features and upgrades than I even thought, and some that I just simply didn't even see coming. So let's do a real quick overview of what's new, what's different, and what we'll hopefully see on Flight 7. Let's get started. SpaceX put out a very detailed press release about the updates to Flight 7 and the new Starship. But if you want even more details on every single nut and bolt and every little change, may I suggest the articles on ringwatchers.com. Okay, let's start off with one of the biggest and most obvious upgrades, which is the upgrades to the upper flaps of the nose flaps of Starship. They've been shrunk in size, they're closer to the nose, and they're further away from the heat shield. This keeps them more out of the way during re-entry and simplifies the dynamic seal that has been eaten up on previous missions. They also increased propellant volume by a whopping 25%, which greatly increases the performance capabilities at the sacrifice of payload volume, which there is still no shortage of compared to other rockets. On the topic of propellant, the propellant feed lines have been vacuum jacketed, preventing boil off of the precious propellant. There's also new fuel feed lines for the Raptor vacuum engines and an improved propulsion avionics, which all add to the performance and duration potential of Starship. The heat shield is using the latest generation of tiles that include a backup layer in case a tile breaks or is damaged. We've seen tests of that prior, but there's also a few heat shields that are actually missing and removed to stress test Starship and experimental metal heat shield tiles, including one with active cooling. Now, I'm not sure what exactly they mean by active cooling, whether it's transpirational cooling, where they have tiny little holes in the metal and then they leak propellant out. Uh, those, it creates a boundary there. I have an old video about that if you want to learn more about transpirational cooling, or if it's regen cooling, like what we see in the, the walls of rocket engines to keep them cool. I also have a video about how you keep a rocket engine cool that talks about regenerative cooling. So it's, but the word active definitely does imply that there's some type of cryogenic propellant flowing through it. I don't know by what exact means, but it is extremely exciting. There's been a complete overhaul of the avionics, adding additional capability and redundancy, including a more powerful flight computer, antennas that combine Starlink, global navigation satellite systems, and backup RF. They have new inertial navigation, star trackers, and smart batteries. Another upgrade that I'm very much looking forward to is even more cameras. Starship already has probably the most cameras of any launch vehicle that I've ever known, and they're already really high quality. They're going to over 30 cameras now on Starship, which is awesome. We'll take all the views we can get, and hopefully we see some incredible views on Flight 7. And these views are all thanks to Starlink. SpaceX says they can stream more than 120 megabits per second of real-time HD video, which is simply unheard of for space video transmission. A new milestone we'll hopefully see on Flight 7 is the deployment of 10 Starlink mass simulators. Now, these have already been loaded on the vehicle. They're dummy simulators, but since Flight 7 follows virtually the same flight profile as 5 and 6, it will never actually be in orbit. Its lowest point of its trajectory will always intercept the atmosphere. This means the Starlink mass simulators will re-enter in the same exclusion corridor as the ship, and they will burn up on re-entry. We do expect to see another Raptor relight test, which will hopefully provide even more data and confidence that the vehicle is capable of deorbiting once it's in orbit. And this is important because you really need to make sure you can confidently and controllably bring Starship back down once it's in orbit. If for some reason, uh, or the Raptor doesn't, you know, they have a problem and it can't relight and uh, it gets stuck in orbit, it'll stay up there for a long time until atmospheric drags, you know, eventually brings it back down uncontrolled, which means it could re-enter over populated areas and a vehicle that weighs hundreds of tons of stainless steel re-entering uncontrolled overpopulated areas is a very bad thing. There's been some tweaks to the structure of Starship, which will hopefully make it stronger and more robust. And after having seen signs of deformation on Flight 6's re-entry, it seems like they found a, you know, a few weak points and they uh, you know, fairly easily were able to upgrade and strengthen those particular spots. And on that note, they're also again pushing the limits of stress on the flaps during the point of maximum entry dynamic pressure similar to how they push the limits of Starship on Flight 6. Now, it's important to learn these bounds now on Starship, you know, when they have the ability to, to test it during all these, you know, kind of suborbital test flights before they end up being operational missions. It, you might as well learn the full envelope of your vehicle, push it hard, learn what fails, what doesn't, and go from there. Flight 7 Starship, which is Starship 33. I don't think I've actually mentioned that yet. Yeah, this is number 33, it's the first V2. It does feature some non-structural versions of the catch fittings installed on the side of Starship to test their thermal performance. 
This is a good sign that they are getting closer to hopefully trying to catch a Starship if these fittings come back in decent shape. And on the topic of the catch, SpaceX has upgraded and protected the sensors on the tower and chopsticks. Those are the ones that got damaged in Flight 6 that ended up resulting in an aborted catch attempt. This means we'll hopefully have a better chance of seeing a catch of the booster for Flight 7. Lastly, another fun milestone is the fact that the booster is reflying one of the Raptor engines flown on Flight 5, which is the one that was first caught. Specifically, the Pi Raptor or Raptor 314, which is awesome. Assuming it goes well, it will hopefully provide more data and confidence towards a full booster reuse, which I hope we will maybe see this year, maybe even within the next few launches. So Flight 7 is definitely a launch that you're not going to want to miss. Speaking of things you don't want to miss, be sure and check out the Astro Awards live in person January 25th and 26th in Austin, Texas. Which is a huge event now, two days of panels and speeches and the actual award ceremony itself where we hand awards to the people in charge of these incredible missions. And we have uh, tons of new programming, like we'll have the entire crew of Players Dawn doing a panel. Uh, we have uh, astronaut Charlie Duke, <laughs> an Apollo moonwalker is doing a keynote and is also on a panel. We have a lot of cool panels, a lot of really cool things. We hopefully will see you at Astro Awards, astroawards.live. Uh, we are almost completely out of tickets, so if you've thought about doing that, better get on that right now before they sell out. And I owe a huge thank you to my Patreon supporters. If you want to become a supporter, head on over to patreon.com slash everydayastronaut or YouTube members and ex-subscribers. You all are making all of this possible. So thank you so, so much. And another fun way to support the channel is to go to everydayastronaut.com slash shop. Get yourself some heat shield mugs, color changing heat shield mugs and lots of other cool stuff everydayastronaut.com slash shop thank you so much for your support okay that's gonna do it for me i'm tim dodd the everyday astronaut bringing space down to earth for everyday people <laughs>